Hey there, I'm Pastor Darrell. Welcome to Mount Moriah. As I said in my prayer, we live in an extremely chaotic world. Um, I find myself struggling with emotions a lot lately. Primarily the emotion of anger and fear of just where we're heading. Then I was struck by, I was teaching this in Sunday school, this passage several months ago, and it just struck me that in, in the face of everything Jesus was uh, dealing with, he was able to maintain his focus. He was main, able to focus on his purpose and, and not his situation. And as I studied and prepared for this, I came across um, some teaching by C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis was talking about, and you know, as, as we know from Scripture, um, Solomon taught there's nothing new under the sun. And we find ourselves, as I said, in a chaotic time, in a chaotic place. But as C.S. Lewis said, in his time, people were praying and wondering, where was God? Where was God in all this? And why doesn't God just come and, you know, bring Jesus back and, and begin his millennial kingdom? And the answer that C.S. Lewis had, I think, was very interesting. And it's a good answer for us, I believe, in this time is that God still wants to leave every opportunity for those who don't know his son, Jesus Christ, to come to know him. And so as, as I thought about what to teach on and I reflected on this passage that I chose, it just reminded me that we need the same focus that Jesus had and to get away from focusing on our situation and focus on our purpose, as it says right on our window back there, we're called to be disciples. We're called to take the message of the gospel to the world. And boy, in my 62 years, I've never seen the world in more need of the gospel. I love Ecclesiastes. It's one of my favorite books. And I always find myself gravitating to the last second to last verse of the book. We know what Ecclesiastes is about. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, is out pursuing everything the world has to offer. And he draws a conclusion. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. And he boils it down to one thing. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. So as we look at the scripture this morning... Scripture we, I'm sure, are all very familiar with. It's the crucifixion of Jesus. I would just remind everyone that we do have a purpose. We do have a calling as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ. And it's not to live in fear. It's not to live in anger. Um, but it's to share the love of Jesus. So let's go to Luke chapter 23. I'm going to read 33 through 46. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, <clears throat> coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And the inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do, not, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he said, 
Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Father God, Lord, I just pray that you would move me out of the way and speak through me. Lord, that you would remind us of the power that we have through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And Lord, that you would help us to focus on our purpose, our calling as followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, lead and guide in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I titled this message, Leading with, Living with Purpose. And we see right here in the beginning that in the face of everything that Jesus was dealing with, it says he was led to a place called Calvary, and there they crucified him. Just a short time before this, he went through a mock trial, basically four trials, where they made all kinds of false accusations against him. The people who had just a week before had been praising him and crying Hosanna were now crying crucify him. After the, the end of the trial, he was scourged to a point where he wasn't even able to carry his own cross. And now they crucify him. And I won't spend the time to talk about the pain of a crucifixion, but we all understand what Jesus was dealing with here. Yet, in verse 34, we see Jesus demonstrating his focus on his purpose. We know, we have the advantage of knowing that Jesus came to save the lost. But here he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Through all this, Jesus maintained his understanding of his purpose. By calling out the name of his Father, it shows that even in the face of crucifixion, Jesus maintained that relationship. Jesus maintained his obedience to his Father. He was God. He could have stopped this at any time. But yet, not only did he maintain his obedience to his Father, he continued to recognize why he was hanging on that cross, and it was for the forgiveness of sins. He was ultimately paying the price for their sins and our sins. He was the unblemished lamb, the sacrificial lamb. And even to the very end, we see that Jesus never lost focus. Even when he was tempted in the garden, even throughout his entire ministry, Jesus continued to maintain relationship with his Father, to maintain that obedience, to maintain his sinlessness, and to focus on his purpose, which was to save those of us who were unable to save ourselves. Then we get to see kind of a picture of the world, a picture of man, our spiritual blindedness. Until such time as the Holy Spirit starts to deal with our hearts and soften our hearts, we're spiritually blinded. We can have all the head knowledge we want. We can read scriptures, but until such time as the Holy Spirit starts to deal with us and starts to expose to us our real need for a Savior. You know, we live in a world where there's a, at least 50% of the population that believes that man is inherently good. And that's something I just don't understand, and certainly it's not backed up by Scripture. I'm reminded of the Tower of the Babel and, and, and other things in the Old Testament where man was trying to become like God. And there are religions that teach that we can evolve, and we evolve, and we become more and more like God. I see no evidence of that in the world today. I see evidence of spiritual blindness. I see evidence of a world in need of a Savior. I see evidence in my own life, even though I, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior and I call myself a follower of Christ, I see evidence in my own life of the need for that relationship, that, that connectedness with the Holy Spirit, that, that focus on my purpose so that I don't get drug into the ways of the world, that I don't find myself thinking 
things in anger or in fear as I see what goes on in this world. And here we see in the next several verses a picture of that spiritual blindness of a nation of Israel that had been promised a Savior. And when that Savior came, because they wanted him to fit into their box, they wanted a Savior that was going to come on a white horse with a legion of soldiers and, and take them out from under Roman control. They missed Jesus. And we see a couple of examples here. In verse 35, the rulers say, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Then the soldiers mocked him and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And then one of the criminals blasphemed him and said, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. The problem here is the definition of saved. They didn't understand the meaning of the word saved. They were thinking in the temporal and not the eternal sense. As I said, they wanted someone who was going to save them from the oppression of the Romans. They wanted a great king, a a worldly king. But Jesus came as a humble servant, and, and they weren't able to comprehend that. They weren't even able to understand it. I know when I first came to follow Jesus Christ, it was hard for me to comprehend that. It's hard for me to comprehend that salvation is just simply a matter of accepting what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But then I came to understand that there's far more to it than that. It also entails taking up our cross and following him and serving him and making him Lord of our life. So when we see these soldiers mocking him, we see the leaders mocking him, it's due to their spiritual blindedness. We know that Jesus taught in parables during his earthly ministry. He taught in parables and he told his disciples that he taught that way because of their spiritual blindedness, that they weren't even able to understand him. And it's because our hearts were hardened. If you need proof of that, read the Gospels. Read how the crowds responded when Pilate washed his hands and gave him an opportunity to free Jesus Christ, and they, and they cried, crucify him, crucify him. They released a murderer in place of Jesus. And then when Pilate basically said, let the, his blood be on your lives, they welcomed it. Their hearts were hardened. It takes a heart softened by the Holy Spirit to really be able to accept the message of Jesus Christ. But today, when you look at these passages of Scripture, understand that Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew what he was getting into. He knew who he was dying for. And it was for you and I. It's for every lost sinner. We see in the next example a criminal saved at the last minute. And and sometimes we wonder, is a deathbed confession real? Only Jesus knows that. Only Jesus knows our heart. Only Jesus knows if our confession is real. All you have to do is read 1 John, and every time I read 1 John, I scratch my head and sometimes question my own salvation. Because sin still does persist in our lives even after we come to know Jesus Christ. And as I said when I first came up here, it's the first time in a long time I had nerves. And it's just because I recognize my own unworthiness. But as I start to look into Scripture, I'm emboldened by the fact that the Holy Spirit speaks through God's Word and He doesn't need me. He can use me, and I pray that he does. And as I prayed this morning, I pray that he speaks through me and moves me out of the way. But here we see Jesus totally focused, hanging on the cross. And we see in, I titled this this third section, Trusted. We need to understand and learn to trust Jesus for who he says he is. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Paul talks about that Jesus 
was crucified and died according to the Scripture, rose again according to the Scripture, and then goes on and talks about all the witnesses. It's one of the most witnessed and verified events in history, Jesus' resurrection. We can trust in his resurrection, and we see a model here in verses 40 through 43 in this criminal's confession and, and coming to salvation, a model for redemption. In verse 40, the second criminal, which we know from John's gospel, that he, he was also blaspheming Jesus just a moment before, but all of a sudden he comes to a recognition of his own sinfulness. And he says to the other criminal, he says, but to the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This penitent thief's prayer reflects his belief that his soul lives on after death. Those of us who are followers of Jesus understand that. We know that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we begin eternal life. We still have our time to spend here on earth, but eternal life is guaranteed to us. This penitent thief understood that. He also understood that Christ had a right to rule over his kingdom. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So we see a recognition of his sinfulness and of Jesus' sinlessness. He said, indeed, we justly are receiving condemnation for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. The first step to coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior is first accepting our own sinfulness our own barrenness, our our inability to ever have a relationship with a holy God without the cleansing of Jesus' blood. He recognized that. And then he demonstrates genuine repentance and a recognition of Jesus' divinity and lordship. When he says, remember me, How can a man about to die remember someone? This condemned thief recognized Jesus for who he was. And in doing so, he demonstrates a genuine repentance and a true faith. When he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom, his faith was that Jesus belonged with God overseeing his kingdom. His faith demonstrates that he recognized Jesus for who he was when he calls him Lord. His faith was a true faith, and his faith gets rewarded. Jesus' response in verse 43 is a response that we can all put our trust in. His response is assuredly or truly I tell you, or I say to you in my translation, today you will be with me in paradise. Three truths in this verse that we can trust. Three truths in this verse that we can rely on as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ. First is that Jesus' kingdom is a present reality. Jesus says truly, or I say to you, or I tell you, So first of all, he calls attention to the fact that this is the truth. This is authority. It's Jesus' authority saying this, and he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Today, Jesus' kingdom is a present reality. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today you can come to know Jesus Christ and have that present reality of a relationship with the Son of God. Second, he says that he's going to be with us, that Jesus' kingdom involves communion with Jesus Christ. Our relationship that begins here 
in the world, in the temporal world, will continue when we go to be with him, as he says, in paradise, which is another name for heaven. We don't have to wonder what's going to happen to us when we pass from this world to the next. We can know absolutely. We know that his kingdom is a present reality. It exists today. We know that we can be with him. Once we come into relationship with Jesus Christ, that's guaranteed, that's assured. And we can be with him in paradise, which was God's intention originally for man, was to, to live in communion with God in a, in, a, in a paradise. God didn't mess that up. God didn't break his promise. God never breaks his promise. We messed that up. Man sinned. Man continues to sin. Man is in desperate need of a Savior. God, in his infinite wisdom, sent Jesus. Jesus maintained his focus. He maintained his connection with God, and he drew his strength from God because of that relationship What he calls on him for, as father. He, had, he recognized that he drew his strength. The only way he could have gone to the cross and accepted what was facing him was because he was drawing strength from his relationship with the Father. Because of his obedience, God gave him the strength to carry out his responsibility. And finally, I, in closing, I, I titled this last section, Sacrificed. Through all the suffering, through everything Jesus faced, we see a scene. It says, now it was about the sixth hour, verse 44, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Just imagine that. Imagine everything going dark. The sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. The concept of the veil it, it was the veil separated and hung from the very top of the Holy of Holies to the ground and it separated everyone from the Holy of Holies. Only the priest could go in and, and have contact with God. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, because of what Jesus did on the cross, that veil was torn from top to bottom, gone. We can now have direct relationship with a holy God. That doesn't kind of blow your mind. Um, you need to check your pulse because it's a pretty amazing thing to comprehend the God who created our universe a holy God, a perfect God, would give us the opportunity, sinful man, the opportunity to be in relationship with him. Not only the opportunity, but through our relationship with Jesus Christ, the guarantee that someday we'll spend eternity with him in paradise. In the final verse, we hear Jesus cry out, it says, and when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Through the suffering, through the mocking, through the mock trial, through everything that Jesus faced here on earth, he maintained his relationship with the Father. His last words began with Father. He understood his purpose. He understood his power. He understood that the Father could be trusted. He, all, he demonstrated that ultimate trust when he called out and said, into your hands I commit my spirit. He also understood that as the body dies, the spirit lives on. 
that weren't true, I would tell you to go out and live life and just do as you please. Do whatever pleases you, whatever pleases your flesh. And if you don't believe that there's an afterlife, it's probably the way you should live. But there is. We're guaranteed that. We're assured of that. And Jesus, in his last breath, reminded us of that, that we have a spirit, and that spirit will live on in our resurrected bodies in the presence of Jesus Christ for all eternity if and when we turn our lives over to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, you are an awesome God. You love us in spite of ourselves. You love us when we're unlovable. And Lord, from the very beginning of time, as John reminds us in the beginning of his gospel, you had a plan. You had a plan for mankind, even though mankind turned their backs on you. You had a plan of redemption. And that plan came to life in Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for how it reminds us that we have a purpose. Our purpose is eternal. Certainly we have a responsibility to live in this world as, as citizens, as parents, as friends, as siblings. But Lord, our focus needs to be on you. Lord, teach us through these passages to learn to trust you just as Jesus did. And Lord, also help us to understand that like the two criminals, we have a choice. We can choose to ridicule Jesus, to ignore what he did on the cross, to blaspheme him, or we can choose call him Lord, to accept him, to surrender to him, and to allow him to be Lord of our life. And when that happens, Lord, we come into your presence. So for God, I just ask that you would speak to everyone here. Lord, remind us that we need to be busy introducing our loved ones to Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there are any here or any on watching us this morning who don't know your son, Jesus Christ, as Savior, don't let another moment pass. It's a simple act of surrender. It's a simple act of recognition of our need. As Isaiah said, we're like filthy rags, but we can be washed clean through the blood of Jesus Christ. So God, as we sing this closing song, I just pray that if there are any that need to come to know you, that they would reach out, Lord, and, and get on their knees and pray the simple prayer of asking you into their life, surrendering to you, turning from their sinful ways and turning to Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.